All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you don't already know me, my name is Clarice Wheeler. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Southern Nevada Programs Coordinator here at Friends of Nevada Wilderness. So before we uh, get started, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that here in Southern Nevada, we are on the unceded ancestral lands of the Southern Paiute or New Wuvi people, um, where our speaker David resides on the unceded ancestral lands of the Cayuse, Matia, and Walla Walla tribes. Uh, what is now called Nevada is home to 27 federally recognized and countless more non-federally recognized tribes of indigenous people. These people are the original stewards of the land and continue to care for our precious natural places to this day. I would like you to take or invite you to take a moment to consider the, like, the many legacies of colonization and how they have brought us here today. So for those of you who might be new to our speaker series, Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a statewide nonprofit focused on protecting wild lands. Um, we, uh, wilderness areas are natural landscapes that are largely unaffected by people. And we protect these lands in a few main ways. Uh, we advocate by speaking up for these lands to get them permanently protected and managed to maintain their wildness. We educate by sharing the values and vision of wilderness at community events. Uh, presentations just like this one, and finding the common ground to protect our wildland heritage. And we steward, because these lands cannot protect themselves, we work with volunteers on the ground to help monitor, restore, and improve access to these special places. We hold this wild speaker series every first Thursday of the month by hosting a local environmental expert for people who are interested in learning more about the outdoors and ways to get involved with conservation efforts. Now, let me let int introduce you to our speaker. Uh, David Lucas is a speaker, writer, and naturalist who has led thousands of walks, talks, classes, workshops, and tours, including more than 10 years working as a prolific hiking guide and educator, an educator excuse me, in Yosemite National Park. He'll be our speaker tonight in our final uh, part in a four-part series about bird biology. Um, and um, I just have some housekeeping notes before we jump in. Seems that when we started this evening, we had a, a little bit of connectivity issues. So I'm gonna ask everybody to stay on mute and um, keep their cameras off so that speaker can come through properly. Um, and please drop your questions in the chat throughout the presentation and we will get to them once the presentation is finished. Um, if there's anything that stands out to you as well, we'd love to uh, hear that as well. And with that, I will pass it off to David. Sorry, I was muted there. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming back. Um, I hope some of you are returning for this fourth of four series. This has been so much fun. And I thank Clarice and uh, Friends of Nevada Wilderness for this incredible opportunity to for us to get together and talk about birds for four months in a row and just kind of go through the seasons with different topics. And tonight, appropriately enough, we're going to end up with bird nests and eggs, a pretty cool topic. Um, this is my first time giving this talk, so I was telling Clarice, uh, sorry, if it, uh, I don't know exactly how long that's going to go. Uh, so we'll just launch in and see how it works. So let me go ahead and get this share my screen. <clears throat> and I think that works, right, Clarice? Yes, I can see everything perfectly. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, I know a lot of you are returning, uh, but just by introduction, um, as, as she mentioned, I'm a freelance naturalist. I've spent my life teaching people about the natural world, basically just hiking every day, observing, taking notes, and then coming home with questions that I research in my library that I carry around with me, and then turning what I learn into talks and classes, workshops. I make videos, I write articles, I write books. Um, I wrote a book called Birds of the Great Basin, I think, uh, Watchable Birds of the Great Basin. I can't remember, it's been so long. Um, and my most recent project is a newsletter at my website. So if you go to my website, lucasguides.com, I do a newsletter every week, and I just posted one today about pollen. Uh, and the one last week was about spaces between words. So it's always different every week. So if you subscribe, you'll get a fascinating email newsletter every week. So please sign up. Um, and tonight we're going to be talking about birds, 
and our nests and their eggs. And before I get started, I want to just emphasize that this is an educational presentation. And so I'm going to be using a number of um, diagrams and illustrations from this book, uh, Handbook of Bird Biology, an excellent handbook by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. I think it's the single best textbook on bird biology, and I can't recommend it highly enough if you're interested in learning more about birds and our biology. And I'll also be using a variety of images from the internet to illustrate some of the points we're going to be talking about. And I just mentioned that because I did not take these photographs in case you're wondering about my photographic skills. Um, but today we're going to focus on bird nests and eggs. And I think this is a fascinating topic. And it's one of the most important parts of a bird's life. And one of the things we need to keep in mind when we think about birds nesting and raising young is that this is a calculated risk and it's a dramatic departure from the avian lifestyle of birds that spend all their time flying around. And then all of a sudden they're sitting in a little nest for weeks at a time. It's a totally different way of being and birds have to take that into account. And at the same time, laying eggs and protecting them inside of a secure nest is like having an external womb where you can put your babies in it and it frees you up to fly away and escape from predators and live for another day. And also, it allows both parents to participate in the raising of the young, which is really important. You're externalizing the incubation period so both parents can participate. And I think uh, it's interesting that breeding and having young is critical for birds, of course, but reproduction is going to always be a trade-off between your output and the risk you incur by creating that output. And it all is gonna start before any nests are built or before you lay any eggs, because you're claiming a territory, you're singing, you're doing courtship displays, and all of these are high profile activities that are going to attract the attention of predators. Yet at the same time, having a territory is gonna be critical because females aren't gonna mate with you if you don't have a territory. And territories are places where you have exclusive access to food and other resources, and you are secure from interference from competitors who want to just sneak around and try to mate with your mate or steal some of your food and stuff. So a territory is a secure place. And ultimately for females, they want the best resources for their chicks. And these resources can, can contain both the resources within the territory and the resources that are in the genes that the male has to offer. And interestingly enough, it seems like the territory is the most important consideration for a female because actually females can easily sneak off and mate with any male they want if she wants his genes. So ultimately it's the territory that's more important. And even before we get into talking about nests and eggs, let's consider some of these trade-offs between output and risk and how this is gonna impact uh, bird strategies, because when breeding, a bird has to assess how long is it going to live, and does it want to put all of its effort into a single breeding season, or take a more cautious approach and save its efforts for future years. So for instance, a large bird like an albatross produces only one egg every two years, but these adult birds uh, have a 95% survival rate. So they're almost guaranteed of being alive to breed again the next year and the next year and the next year for a long lifespan. But in comparison, a smaller bird might have 15 young in a one year, but half of those adults are not gonna survive to the next year. So that's an immense effort, but it's worth the risk because it's a 50-50 shot that you're gonna ever have a chance to breed again. So why not give it everything you got for one intense breeding season? But it's even more of a gamble than this because any bird that's gonna maximize its reproductive effort in one year, may not recover to breed the next year, whereas another bird of the same species may decide to scale back a little bit, not have as many babies, and then it's going to recover more quickly and come back the next year and have more babies the next year. So it's even within the same species, it's a bit of a gamble and a bit of a trade-off whether you want to, I don't want to even use the metaphor, but throw all your eggs in one basket one year or dole them out for multiple years. Um, but the strategy of having more babies 
in putting out a tremendous effort is not the only way to improve your reproductive output. Um, you can also improve your output by ensuring that more of your babies survive. So it's common for 50% of all the nests to be lost due to predators. So if you hide your nests from predators, you can end up with more babies without physically wearing yourself out. And, more, and a lot of birds use this strategy of increasing their reproductive output by hiding their nests. And then there's also a lot of significant differences in your nesting success, whether one parent is helping at the nest, helping guard and feed babies, or whether both parents. And so in birds like red-winged blackbirds, where the males are trying to accumulate a large harem of females, a female can choose between raising her ba babies on a high quality territory with a large harem and no attention from the male, or she can go to a low quality territory and have all the male's attention, but be on a low quality territory. And it turns out that females prefer to be on a high quality territory and not have the male's attention and be part of a harem. Um, and then juncos like this dark eyed junco here have a really interesting story as well. So in juncos, the flashiest males that have the sweetest songs are terrible fathers because they're preoccupied with showing off. And the mediocre males realize there's no point in showing off, so they're great fathers. And what's fascinating about the juncos is that the older, more experienced females always choose to mate with the sexy studs while younger inexperienced females pick mediocre males. So why is this? Well, it turns out that both of these strategies are good choices. So in years with lots of food, females who mate with the studs are gonna get the best genes for their babies, and they have no problem finding enough food to raise the babies on their own. But in years when the food is scarce and hard to come by, the females that mate with the mediocre males who don't have the best genes but are great fathers end up doing better because there's two parents cooperating and helping at the nest. And in general, it's better if birds are monogamous and both parents are helping at the nest and helping raise babies because it takes a ton of work, as we'll see, to raise babies. Um, so in a way, the nest is going to be the centerpiece of the bird's breeding season. You know, this is the place that holds and protects eggs and babies. And in the base, best cases, it's even going to hide your babies from predators. It's also a place to sleep at night, and it's a place for courtship. So let's talk about courtship. For birds, flight is paramount. It's everything for a bird that they're able to fly efficiently and quickly. And in order to do that, you cannot afford to carry around extra weight. And what this means is that males and females have to perfectly coordinate their reproductive readiness. Males, for example, have testes that will grow to several hundred times the weight and size volume um, during the breeding season. And you can't afford to carry these around. You need to carry them around for the shortest period of time. And females are gonna be producing eggs and they need to lay these eggs quickly because eggs weigh a lot. So the whole act of having courtship together and nest building together helps trigger ovulation and it synchronizes the pair's reproductive readiness. So they're gonna both be ready to mate at the same time. And then the timing is all important also because birds are gonna be matching the hatching of their babies with peak food availability. So if we look at great horned owls, for example, they're going to start nesting in, say, late January, early February, because they want these little owlets to be coming off the nest and starting to hunt on their own. At the same time, there's, there's lots of baby birds and baby mammals leaving their nests and fumbling around in the world, not knowing how to get away. And the baby owls are just coming off the nest, learning how to hunt and catching these inexperienced prey items. So they want to nest really early to time it just right. But a goldfinch here in the lower left is going to nest in the summer 
when grass seeds are reaching their peak numbers because that's what they're feeding the young. So different birds are timing at different times a year for their best food. And the only bird that's really uh, separate from that need is gonna be pigeons and doves because pigeons and doves have a unique strategy where the, the parents eat food and then they turn into pigeon milk, which is a special fluid produced by cells in the lining of their esophagus. And they cough that up and feed their babies this processed food that comes from whatever the adults are eating. And it frees up pigeons and doves to have very long nesting seasons, eat a wide range of foods and have their babies throughout the whole year. But you know, each bird is gonna be nesting in a specific habitat and eating a specific kind of food. So timing is critical. You wanna just time it just right. And this bird nest is a incredible structure that requires a tremendous amount of energy. So barn swallows, for example, make about 1,200 trips to collect the materials that they need for their nests. An oriole might need 3,400 grass stems to make its nest. And then a woodpecker needs to hammer on a tree about 100,000 times to make a cavity. All of these things are a huge amount of effort. Um, and then the smallest nests are a bird called the bee hummingbird. They're less than an inch wide. And the largest known nest was a bald eagle nest that was uh, 20 feet tall and nearly 10 feet across. And a female might do all of the work of building these nests by themselves. And the male, he might do nothing. Uh, he might work just as hard as the female, or he might simply bring materials that the female then weaves into the nest. And it's ultimately the female that's going to decide where the nest is gonna be though the male may move around and show her sites that he prefers, but she makes the final decision. For example, um, male marsh wrens will first build about 20 courting nests on his territory to show off his prowess and show off all the different parts of his territory. And then when a female shows up, he will show her his 20 or plus nests that he's made and if she likes him, she will pick one and finish it to her preferences. Oh, and sometimes females are gonna make unusual choices and nest in the goofiest spots. So there are records of, of birds nesting on slow moving trains, for instance, or nesting on ferries that are making daily runs back and forth. And there are so many examples of birds um, with goofy nest sites that it's clear that birds are flexible in their choices. Um, but many birds build a new nest every year because their old nests break down and they're also full of parasites from the previous year. But at the same time, many other birds reuse old nests or they use nests that are left behind by other species. And then if a bird is going to nest several times during the course of the breeding season, it will often nest in a different location. Um, to maximize different seasons, different parts of the season. For example, when a song sparrow builds a nest early in the season, it's usually located on the ground. And then when they build nests later in the year, those nests are located higher up in shrubs as the shrubs begin to leaf out and provide more uh, protection. So we're gonna talk about different kinds of nests, but first let's look how at how a basic nest might be constructed. And let's use the example of the familiar robin. So robins are an example of a bird where males will closely attend the female and he'll even bring her materials as she builds up the nest, but he doesn't actually help make the nest because ultimately <clears throat> the female is gonna be doing all the work of sitting on the eggs. So she needs the nest to fit her body shape. And you can see this in how they build her the nest here in this example. Um, a typical songbird nest is gonna take about six days to build, three days to make an outer wall, and then three days to add the lining in the center. And the first step in this example here is uh, they're gonna be collecting material and making an outer wall of coarse material like stems and small branches. These are often gonna be moist and pliable so they can be bent into shape and woven together. And then once the female has built up this outer wall, she will press her breast into it 
and turn in a circle and mold the materials up against her body as she turns and begins to make that cup shape around her as she adds more materials and builds up the rim. And then when it's kind of in the shape she wants, one thing that robins do that is unique is they will collect mud and make a solid foundation in the cup. And to carry mud, robins will pick up some grass stems or pieces of moss, dip it into mud and use it like a wick and carry mud to their nest with this wick and smear it on like a paintbrush almost, collect, smear, collect, smear like that. And as the female's doing that, she will frequently again sit in it, press her breast into it, turn and mold the mud to the shape of her body until it's done. And then when she's added enough mud and has the shape, then she will line it with softer materials um, that would be more comfortable for a long-term sitting. Um, and this, like I said, takes about six days. But in the case of robins, if that first nest is destroyed or doesn't work and they build another nest, that one can only take two to three days to build. They put less energy into it because that first effort is the most important effort. And then subsequent efforts are just follow-up efforts. And one thing that's really amazing about bird nests is that they are using a complex range of weaving and knotting techniques uh, as they weave materials together. Uh, and so here are some examples of some knots and weaving techniques that are used by an African weaver finch. But there's lots of other examples of different kinds of knots and weaving techniques that birds use. What's amazing is that all of this is done with their beaks, the tip of their beak and they're using raw, cumbersome natural materials and making this amazing, elegant structure with these really fine knots that, that humans would have a hard time making. So there's a, a range of types of nests that we can talk about. Uh, you can go anywhere from a, just no nest at all. We're basically just plopping your egg down on the ground. Uh, birds like vultures, in this case, a common muir on the coast. Nighthawks will do that, just lay your egg on the ground. You can do a simple scrape like a killdeer where you're just kind of making a shallow, kind of moving a few things, uh, maybe even collecting a few things around your body, a shallow scrape. Um, killdeer, turns will do things like this. Uh, you have birds like this coot here in the upper middle that will make a platform, which is a shallow depression in a mound of materials. You, there's no structure to it. You're just piling up materials and then kind of making a little depression in the center where you sit in it. Uh, coot here, grebes, herons, ospreys, mourning doves are some of the birds that will do that. Uh, birds in grassland areas especially will make a domed nest on the ground. This metal arc here, snipe will do this also where it's covered uh, from the sky. So predators flying over, don't look down and see the eggs of babies sitting in there because they're vulnerable. Uh, another form of that would be up off the ground, a globular nest like magpies here in the lower left. So a self-contained globe kind of built into the branches. And then you have uh, like cliff swallows here with what's called a retort nest, kind of a gourd shaped nest that they build up out of mud in this case. Uh, bank swallows here is an example of a burrow nest. Bank swallows would do this, burrowing owls, belted kingfishers. Belted kingfishers will make nests, up, uh, their nest tunnels that they build are up to 15 feet deep into the banks of rivers. That's amazing that a kingfisher is building a 15 feet deep tunnel and nesting at the end of that. And then finally, we have cavities, like a woodpecker, a nuthatch, a chickadee. They can either make their own cavities or they can use an old cavity and repurpose it for nesting. And in all of these, we're missing one type of nest that most of the birds are using or making. And what is that? Well, that is your basic cup nests, like the robin earlier. So the majority of birds in the world are doing some sort of cup nest and there's, we can divide that into some categories just to kind of have something to talk about. Um, and I'm using the scientific terminology here, but just the ideas are what's important for our conversation. So a staten nest is just a nest that's built on a hard physical support. You know, like a robin is building a nest on a hard branch. A hummingbird is nesting on a hard branch. A crow is nesting on a hard branch. Um, and in this example, 
a gross beak does something really interesting. They're building on hard branches and they make their nests so flimsy that you can see right through it. That brood is sitting on an egg and it doesn't even look like a nest, which means that a predator is not gonna have a search image that that's a nest and look twice at it. Looks like just a few branches have fallen into the crotch of a tree and are sitting there. And that's a great disguise. It doesn't, you know, once you have a cup, a big firm cup, a predator is gonna see that and like eggs, I know there's eggs there and go check it out. So that's a great strategy here. Uh, you can have pensile nests, which are only hanging by their rim. It's like a bowl just hanging from its rim. Here's a vireo sitting in a pencil nest hanging from its rim with no support for the belly of the nest. Or you can have a pendulous nest, which are completely hanging down. The rim is not supported. Orioles are a great example of a bird that's doing a pendulous nest. And then we have a unique example of adherent nests, which are made with mud and saliva and then plaster to the edge of things. Uh, Phoebes will do this, uh, barn swallows. Barn swallows are a really interesting example. They originally nested in caves, and then they switched the buildings in the mid-1800s, and now there's not a single barn swallow in the wild that nests in caves. They, every one of them is now using some sort of human structure to nest. They made a complete behavioral switch um, within recorded history. It's just a really fascinating example. And birds will use a tremendous variety of materials for their nest. They, everything from rocks to spider webs. And one common ingredient of bird nests, which is interesting, are a wide variety of green leaves. And for a long time, people thought that birds were adding green leaves to their nests as an aesthetic choice, like a decoration. But scientists now realize that birds are using certain types of green vegetation in order to repel or kill insects in the nest. Interesting. And it's also common to see birds using human materials. Um, and scientists did an experiment which found that birds are actually fashion conscious, uh, which is really interesting. So scientists put out a range of yarn with different colors. And what they discovered is that one color is going to be the favorite choice one year. And then another year, another color is going to be the favorite choice of all the birds in an area that are using the yarn. And it's thought that what's happening is that the females are watching each other and copying each other, basically choosing to imitate each other's fashion choices in what they're using for their nests. That's a really interesting idea. Um, one other fascinating choice of nesting material is mud. We mentioned that earlier, and I just wanted to mention that because we often see cliff swallows who make mud nests um, gathering mud on the ground. And it's a fascinating behavior because you'll see them quivering their wings over their backs. And this does two things for them. One is that quivering their wings gives them just enough lift that they can keep their bellies out of the mud because they don't have strong legs and feet. So they're quivering and just, just keeping their bodies up as they're grabbing mouthfuls of mud. And it also, by having your wings up over your back, it prevents males from pouncing on you and trying to copulate with you because these males are so amped on hormones. They're so aggressive. They will try to mate with any swallow that lands. They just figure they pounce and try to mate. And if it's another male, it's going to shrug them off. And if it's female, maybe they'll get lucky. And the way to prevent that is to put your wings over your back and quiver them and they can't land on your back and just, uh, just try to mate with you. But here's a question you may have never thought of before. So how do these cliff swallows gather sticky, gooey mud and then get it off their beaks and build these beautiful nests with it? Well, scientists finally discovered how they do that. So the swallows first gather mud in their beaks. Then when they get back to the nest, they vibrate their bills really quickly. And this liquefies the mud in the same way that an earthquake liquefies the ground and makes buildings fall over. And by vibrating their bills really fast, the mud liquefies, and then they can apply this liquid mud droplet exactly where they want it. And as soon as they stop, that mud droplet solidifies like concrete exactly where they put it. And you can see that in the shape of the nest. Every one of these is a perfect round droplet from the vibration of the bill turned into a liquid droplet and then solid in an instant as it stops vibrating. And uh, once the nest is finished, then the bird's gonna get down to the work of laying eggs. And um, birds are unique because they're the only vertebrates that only lay eggs rather than give live birth. So like 
snakes and lizards lay eggs, but then they also, some species have live young, but all birds only lay eggs. And fish and amphibian eggs can only survive in water, but reptiles, birds, and mammals broke this dependency on water environments by encasing their embryos inside of an amniotic membrane, which basically creates its own enclosed water environment for the larva the embryo to develop in. And then reptiles and birds add that hard shell around the amniotic membrane so that you can raise your embryo outside of the body. So that's their modification. And then birds modified this strategy even further by incubating their eggs, which allows them to use a far greater range of habitats and conditions than reptiles, which need a certain temperature and moisture, but birds can sit on their eggs and take care of them. Another key difference is that reptiles have protein inside of the egg as the source of energy for the embryo, which is great, but not the best. But the source of energy for the embryo inside a bird egg is fat. And when fat breaks down, it releases water. And this allows birds to use even more environments. They're not tied to moist soil that they can nest in the middle of the desert um, or in a dry area because the egg has water inside of it and is producing more water inside of it as the embryo develops. And then the eggs are usually laid about 24 hours apart, because that's how long it takes for the female to secrete all of the layers that are built around the ovum or the egg to make the shell and all the membranes and all the other contents. And what she does first is she's going to have a mass of eggs. This is without shells, without other materials, just the, a mass of egg cells waiting in her uterus. And then each one of those is going to sequentially move down her overduct with layers being added to it as it goes further down, then the shell is added and then she lays it. Then the next one takes it 24 hours, then it comes out and that's what she's doing. Females usually have a set number of eggs that they're gonna lay, but some species can continue to lay more eggs if eggs are removed from the nest. And researchers tried removing eggs from a flicker nest and they had a flicker that laid 71 eggs in 73 days. That's how long she kept going, that's amazing. And the general strategy when you're laying an egg every 24 hours is the female will only briefly visit the nest to lay one egg each morning before the sun comes up. Then they leave the nest for the rest of the day and night because they don't want to, they want to, they don't want to attract the attention of predators. Because every time they go back and forth to the nest, the predator is going to see that and think there's activity there. So she wants to do it in the dark and then not visit the nest again at all and just leave the egg there. She's also watching to see if she built the nest in a good spot. Is it like right on the runway of a, of a predator that's gonna be walking by the nest every day? Each day she lays an egg, she's watching. Is it gonna survive? Is it there when I come back? And it, by the time she leaves, lays the last egg, she's like, okay, good sight. Is this gonna be good? Now I'm going to sit on it. Then she'll begin incubating. And one advantage of incubating your eggs is that it allows the parents to keep the temperature of their eggs at a constant 99 to 100 degrees. And this helps regulate the temperature of the eggs. So the female, and sometimes the male, will drop the breast feathers and create a brood patch where she can press bare skin against the eggs and keep them warm. This skin becomes swollen with fluids and blood vessels and directly connects the eggs to the heat of her body. And when the temperatures are cold, they can war they can huddle over the eggs and keep them warm. And if it's hot, they can go to water and soak their feathers in water and then come back and use evaporative cooling to keep the eggs at the right temperature with cooling. They, they looked at a pair of black neck stilts at the Salton Sea in California, and they were recorded making 115 trips in a single day to soak their feathers in water to keep their eggs cool. Um, another advantage of the incubation is that it allows both parents the opportunity to help out at the nest, and it allows an opportunity to escape the nest if a predator comes along. But I want to mention this, this strategy of waiting until all of your eggs are laid, because this is an important consideration. Doesn't it seem strange to you that you would lay an egg and just let it sit there in the cold like all night long? It might be 
freezing at night, you know, if it's still early in the spring, right? And you're leaving it exposed for days while you lay one egg each day. Um, but what's going on is that eggs are actually not impacted by the cold and the embryos aren't even triggered to start growing until they're heated to the right temperature. They don't turn on until they're heated. So it means that the eggs don't activate and they don't start developing until the moment the mother sits on them. And so if the mother sits on the first egg the day it's laid, well, then it's going to hatch a day sooner than the next egg and two days sooner than the following egg. And this is called asynchronous hatching. And for most, for most birds, this is a real problem because then what's happening is your babies are growing up at different rates. They're going to fledge from the nest on different days, which means you're going to have some birds flying around waiting for food out in the branches and other birds are still sitting in the nest waiting to be fed. And you're going to get exhausted flying around trying to find all these babies and keep them fed. So asynchronous hatching can be a disadvantage. And most birds wait until all the eggs are laid, then start sitting on them all at the same time. And this is called synchronous hatching. And this has the advantage that all your babies are gonna grow up on exactly the same timeline, which is a great advantage. Okay, so let's look at the egg itself because this is a marvel of engineering. It's light and it's strong and everything that the growing embryo needs is inside of that shell. Nothing changes about it for the whole time. They're basically a self-contained womb, which come in a variety of shapes and sizes. So consider, for example, this bird, which is a brown kiwi from New Zealand. Its egg is 18 to 25% of their body weight. It's an amazing vari variation on this theme. But ultimately, these sizes and shapes are determined by the shape of the mother's pelvic bone. So for example, owls, which have round eggs, they have uh, deep pelvic bones with a lot of depth to them. And bir birds that have long, narrow eggs have long, shallow pelvic bones. And it, um, let's see, I guess I'll just say that there. Um, they used to think that uh, the shape of the egg was kind of based on where you would nest. So if you nest in a cavity, your eggs aren't going to go anywhere so they can be round and roll around because they're not going to go anywhere. But if you nest on a cliff on a ledge, this is a shape that some birds have like common mirrors on the coast. And I thought that this shape was because the egg with a narrow pointed end would roll in a circle and not roll off the ledge. And that was the thinking for a long time. But now they're calling that in the question because there's so many exceptions to that rule that it's not clear. So I don't know why I mentioned that, but just another point. Um, Eggs are also colored in a fantastic variety of patterns. Eggs that are in open nests are going to expose to the elements tend to be darker and more heavily patterned. And eggs that are in dark cavities tend to be white. Um, and these colors, these patterns on eggs are created from byproducts from bile in the liver. And they are painted on the eggs with tiny glands that squirt jets of dye on the egg as it moves down the ova deck in preparation for laying. And it's thought that all of these different patterns on eggs help a female res recognize her own eggs. And it's worth looking at how an egg forms. So first of all, as I mentioned, all of the yolks for the breeding effort are first prepared in the ovary, sitting there waiting. And then one by one, they are sent down the oviduct, one every 24 hours, because this whole process of adding layer after layer as it moves down takes about 24 hours. And then as a final step, this is where the jets are on the edge of the uterus, and they squirt out dye as the egg is spinning and moving down and create those swirly patterns, and then the egg is laid uh, from there. And all of those components that are added to the egg as it moves down the oviduct can be seen if you break open a chicken egg, an uncooked chicken egg in your kitchen and look at it carefully. So first of all, let's look at this because this is really cool. You can see all these things in an egg if you break it into a dish and look at it. First, there's the yolk. This is the first part of the, uh, of the egg that's formed is the yolk here. And it takes about five to 14 days to form. And it's built in concentric layers that are added like tree rings. Dark yolk is deposited during the day and then light yolk is deposited at night and they're in concentric layers. And when you do um, a hard boiled egg, you can often see these layers peeling off 
after it's cooked, right? So there is formed of these layers. And then at the very top is um, a blasto disc, which is where the growing embryo is going to be. And all of this yolk is all of the stored fat and protein that the embryo is going to need for its development, right? And this is floating in a liquid bath called albumum here. There's another word. It's floating in this clear egg white, a liquid bath. This is going to provide the water for the growing embryo. Uh, it's going to provide insulation from sudden temperature changes, and it's going to provide cushion from impact. And it's critical to the bird that this blasto disc is always at the top and it doesn't touch the shell because if it touches the shell, it will adhere to the shell and the yolk will no longer spin freely. This is an important idea. We'll to return to it again. And in order to float in the center, the yolk is held in place with these rubber band like strings called the chalaza, which hold the yolk floating in the center. And as the egg turns, it can spin freely. And these just kind of spin and twist, but hold it floating in the center as if you had a ball with rubber bands on the side and you were spinning it, keeps it in the center. Then the shell itself is made out of calcium with two layers of membrane. There's an outer shell membrane underneath the shell, which holds the pieces of the shell together. So if it breaks, it doesn't just fall apart. The pieces of shell will stay intact. And then there's an inner shell membrane, which holds all of the contents together. And when you hard boil an egg, this is the layer that's hard to peel off is this inner shell membrane. <clears throat> and at 18 hours, that blasto disc begins dividing into cells that line up. So right here, floating on top here is the little blasto disc where the embryo starts forming. These cells line up and they make a trough, a linear trough. And there's a there's a head end, there's a tail end, there's a left side, there's a right side, there's a belly, and there's a back. All of those dimensions are already there in just a linear trough. Then the sides of that trough begin to raise up, they curl over and they connect and they make a tube. And that tube is the spinal cord. And then from that spinal cord in about, what is it, 36 hours, you begin to have specialized groups of cells that come out to make ribs and muscles. Then you have the germs of the eyes that begin to form. And then the important thing is that this embryo then forms some really important membranes. So there's a yolk sac, which is, this sac is holding all of the yolk, which is all the nutrients. Then there's the lantois right here, which is where all the metabolic wastes go. And then there's an amnion around the embryo, which is a liquid chamber, so it can be moistened and, and can move around a little bit. And then there's the chorion, the green here, that holds everything together. There's a, 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 a sac there that holds together. And the chorion is, is like a placenta in a mammal. So sorry, this is a lot of details. I hope you're following along. <laughs> and a lot of diagrams. I like pictures better, but this is stuff that we don't get to see. So I just want to dive in and get into this because this is so cool. We don't normally get to see this. So here's that blasto disc here. And the embryo pops out of that and starts forming separate than the whole yolk, which is down here. So this is all yolk, all the stored material. This the embryo sends out tons of blood vessels and arteries into the yolk to obtain food. And then that alantios, alantois, uh, comes out, and this is where all the metabolic waste goes, and also it forms a lung, it fuses with the cell, uh, the shell, and it exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide with the atmosphere. It's basically breathing through the shell. And here's a question you may not have thought about before. Where, so this embryo is inside of a shell, it can't go anywhere, and it's pooping and peeing basically the whole time. Where does all that go? I mean, why doesn't it just die inside of the cell? Well, animals like humans get rid of our waste with urea. Urea dissolves in water. But if all the waste inside of the egg dissolve in water, it's just going to poison the embryo. So instead, what birds do is they deposit their waste as uric acid, which does not dissolve in water. 
And this allows them to neatly package up all their waste, put it off on the side of the shell, and it doesn't poison the embryo. It's a really critical feature of birds and mammals, do, uh, birds and reptiles do this too. Um, and I'm not going to go into the detail in the shell here. I just want to point out that the shell is a marvelously complex structure. You just break open an egg of a bird and you don't think about how complex that shell is, but it's a living membrane that allows that embryo inside to breathe and survive. And it's made out of calcium pillars that are bound together with collagen. And in between these pillars are pores. There's about 17,000 pores in a shell that allow a free interchange of gases to get rid of carbon dioxide and take in oxygen. And then the blood vessels from the um, uh, embryo are running through the base of the shell, releasing gases and taking in gases and acting as a lung. And these pores are so critical for the baby that if you take one-tenth of half a drop of oil, it's enough to kill most eggs. It, they're so sensitive to oil covering these pores and suffocating, really critical for them. And then as the day of hatching approaches, there's gonna be a lot of changes that start to happen. So outside the egg, the parent's behavior starts to change as they detect that something's going on. Earlier in the nesting process, the parents are gonna be more inclined to abandon the nest if they're disturbed. At that point, it's like, hey, I'm gonna get away. I'm gonna go start another nest somewhere else and try again. But at this point, this far along where the eggs are about ready to hatch, the parents have invested everything into this batch of eggs. They're going to become really protective of it. They're going to be really quiet around the nest, and they're going to be really secretive. And then if the nest is disturbed, they're going to vigorously defend it rather than fleeing the nest. They'll do everything they can to protect it. And at the same time, the chick inside is making a really difficult transition. Up to this point, it's been breathing through the shell with capillaries and blood vessels and arteries moving gases back and forth. And it has to go from that system to free breathing oxygen while still inside the shell. So what it does is it first breaks through the membrane and breathes oxygen out of this little air sac at the end of the shell. And then it develops a, uh, I guess the beak is here. It develops a little calcium tooth on its beak and it snaps its head up like this and starts to hit at the shell from the inside. At this point, the shell is thinner because the chick has absorbed a lot of calcium from the, the shell into its own growing bones. So the shell is thinner and it just does this hitting until it makes a hole in the shell and this is called pipping. And then what it does is it kicks with its foot and turns a little bit and does it again then kicks with its foot, turns a little bit, and does it again, and it makes a circle of holes around the blunt end of the egg, and then it can pop off the end. This is where it's critical that it's not stuck to the shell. Remember, we mentioned that earlier, because if it's stuck to the shell, it can't kick and turn and kick and turn and make a series of holes. It's going to be stuck with the same hole, and it'll never get out. That's why it's critical that it's not stuck to the shell inside. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, let's see, just a second. So this process of breaking off the shell and getting out takes about four hours, uh, five hours, say, to four days. And, um, and one other thing that's happening before it hatches out is that it's vocalizing and communicating with its parents and communicating with the other chicks inside of the eggs in the nest. And all the chicks inside of their shells are all peeping at each other, communicating and they do that to coordinate their hatching. So they're all hatching at the same moment. If one's ahead of the rest, it'll slow down and wait until the other ones catch up. And then they all try to hatch at the same moment. So they're synchronizing their hatching. Let's see. So Clarice, I have five more slides. I want to check in with you. How are we doing on time? Yeah, if you have five more slides, we're sitting at 7.50 right now. Um, so- um, Is that okay? I can- Stop or I think it's pretty quick. I'll just go through it. Okay. Yeah. If they're quick, go for it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, I mentioned the idea earlier of synchronous hatching and the advantage to parents is that it's more efficient if all these chicks are all coming out at the same time. But I'm also mentioned that some birds can have asynchronous hatching. 
And this is gonna happen if a bird starts incubating as soon as the first egg is laid and starts sitting on it. And that means that that first egg is gonna be one day ahead of the next egg, two days ahead of the next egg, et cetera, until all the eggs are hatching at a different time. And this is advantageous if your food supplies are limited because what parents are gonna do is they feed the oldest and biggest chick first until it's full. Then they feed the second biggest chick until it's full on down the line. And if the food supply is variable and there's not enough food, that means the last chick or the last couple of chicks in line will just starve and die. But it's guaranteed that the oldest couple of chicks are going to survive and you're going to have some survivors. But if all the chicks are the same age and you're trying to feed all of them with not enough food, they're all going to be weakened and all of your success won't work out. So that's the advantage of asynchronous hatching. Uh, I love this. I want to just throw this idea in here that it's it's really incredible how much work it takes to feed baby birds. Did you know that the baby birds increase their weight about 50 times in three weeks? And all of this phenomenal growth is fueled with a prodigious amount of food. And just to test this out, scientists tried feeding a baby robin as much earthworm as it wanted to eat. And this baby robin ate 14 feet of earthworm before it was full and stopped eating. That would have been a parent feeding at 14 feet. That's a lot. A tree swallow, for example, has to collect about 8,000 insects a day to feed its babies. And they recorded a male house wren that fed its babies every 47 seconds for an entire day. And keep in mind that parents of some species have to do this continuously for about 10 weeks. That's exhausting. So one way to make it easier on parents to take the burden off of them is to have precocial chicks. Precocial chicks come out of the eggs. They have well-developed legs and feet. And within minutes of hatching, they're running around feeding themselves. And the only thing they need their parents for is to protect them from predators and watch over them. And that's a, that's a totally different strategy than ones that have altricial chicks. So precocial chicks, can run around on their own. Altricial chicks are born naked and blind and they're utterly helpless. They can open their mouths, they can swallow, they can digest and poop and that's all. Basically their sole function is to just eat and grow. And they are born with these vividly colored mouth linings so the parents know exactly where the food needs to go and feed them very efficiently. And they have swollen hinges at the corners of their jaws that are loaded with nerves and they spring their mouths open at the slightest touch or whenever there's even a breeze of air, feed me, feed me, feed me. And they have this naked, very thin skin that's pink from their muscles and blood vessels. And at this age, they can't even heat themselves and they need their parents to keep them warm in order to keep their digestion and their growth hormones active. And as you already know, if you've ever watched the bird nest, they grow incredibly fast. And within a couple of weeks, even these birds are already beginning to flap their wings and many species leave the nest before they even fly in order to hide in nearby vegetation to avoid being found by predators. And finally, there comes the moment we've all been waiting for. It's time for the babies to leave the nest and learn about life on their own. So at this point, the parents have invested a ton of effort and energy into the process, taken more risks and made more choices than you might've realized that they were making. And there are obviously a lot of different ways to make nests and raise baby birds. And ultimately there's no single way that's the right way or the best way. These are just different ways of raising birds with different choices for different reasons. And it all seems to work. So that's it. Thank you. So fascinating. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, feel free to drop any questions that you have in the chat, or um, at this time, you are welcome to come off mute and ask your question. Um, either or works perfectly well. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, Joy Lane um, left, uh, told a, a little story in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, that says when she lived in Pennsylvania, she encountered the most exquisite nest she's ever seen, an Eastern Phoebe nest that was woven with moss. One time when mom was away, I peered into, I got a ladder and peered into the nest and saw two large parasitic cowbird eggs mixed in with the smaller and more delicate Phoebe eggs. I took it upon myself to remove the cowbird eggs after donning a latex glove. 
Two weeks later, we had a nest filled with Phoebe chicks, which would certainly not have been the case without my intervention. <laughs> yeah. Cowbirds are a real scourge. They're kind of destroying the bird species of North America. Uh, a really interesting story because uh, brown headed cowbirds evolved with buffalo herds at, they were always on the move. And so they developed the strategy of laying their eggs and then leaving. This is different than a cuckoo. I, I think you said cuckoo, right? No, cowbird, you said cowbird, good. Um, and so they evolved to follow the buffalo herds and eat seeds and buffalo poop and then just lay eggs and bird nests as they went. And a female can lay, I think, 75 eggs in a season, just dropping one egg in a nest in, as she goes. And they just wreck havoc on native birds because the native birds aren't used to them. And when they wiped out the buffalo, the cowbirds changed from following buffalo to following cows. And now they're everywhere in North America and, and just killing off tons of birds. So usually you can't make a difference taking eggs out of a nest like that because they just come back and lay more. But obviously in this case it worked, so good for you. Frank asks, do same species build a similar nest regardless in what part of the world they live or do they adapt to local conditions? And are there any examples? Yeah, I don't have examples specifically because I think there's so many exceptions, but um, uh, I think in general, birds are going to use the materials that are most, you know, within reason that are most easily accessed nor locally they're going to use whatever is local they're not they're not pre-programmed to just use a certain species of grass or a certain kind of branch or a certain kind of leaf i think they're going to use whatever is local but they're doing it with a variety of just simple plant materials little uh shrub stems bits of moss you know bits of grass bits of leaves and those are everywhere so there's nothing too specific about that i don't know if that answers your question frank but building a similar nest, I see here. Uh, but in terms of the shape uh, and the quality of the nest, it would be the same, but the material is going to maybe be more site specific. I hope that answers your question. Rebecca asks, what can I do to attract hummingbirds to nest at my place? One spring, <laughs> a hummingbird nested on an antler on my porch, and I would sure like for it to happen again. Great question. Um, I I think probably just having a variety of shrubs uh, in your yard for a female to choose from and uh, uh, probably a variety of, of, of food sources. Yeah, I, I think a diverse, healthy yard would probably be the best way to do it. You're not going to be able to put out a you know, basket or branch and they're going to use it. They're going to be there because of the food sources. And it's not going to be a hummingbird feeder because, as you know, hummingbird feeders are just going to be taken over by a male who's utterly dominant, totally aggressive, chases everyone away. And the females are trying to avoid that as much as possible. So I think if you have uh, food sources that are like thinly dispersed around your yard, like you don't have a big patch of flowers because then another male is going to take over that, but just scattered habitat. Uh, scattered food sources. It's not worth it to a male to defend that. They're going to go find the best food patches and then leave the females uh, to just nest in peace because females will be attacked by the males while they're nesting. That's probably the best you can do. And I have a question, and I think that will probably be the last question of the night because we're uh, getting close to eight o'clock. Um, but um, my question is, what is, I've seen morning dove nests and they seem to want to put their eggs wherever they can, um, whether that's <laughs> random spot on the ground or they just put, throw a couple twigs on a windowsill and plop their, their <laughs> eggs there. So is there any kind of rhyme or reason to it or are they just that good at, at uh, having like hatching eggs? Uh, for morning doves, huh? <laughs> Well, yes. they do like eight to 10 nests a season or something crazy like that. Uh, they're just so prolific. And, and so they don't put a lot of effort into each nest and just take advantage of whatever they can find. So I think that that's a, probably a valid observation. They're not, they're not with that much effort. They're not building elaborate nests. It's just a simple structure. Thank you. Okay. All right, everybody, we're going to wrap it up for the evening, um, but I just want to 
quickly remind everyone that Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a membership-based organization where 80% of donations we receive go directly to advocating for wilderness protection, restoring habitat for wildlife, and maintaining hiking trails. And we would love uh, for you to become a member joining us in keeping Nevada wild and beautiful. Yay. So thanks again, everybody. Um, and uh, say goodbye to David. Um, this is our last talk with him. Thank you so um, much, and everyone. yeah, thank you so much, David, for joining us these last four months. We've all um, really, thank really you. loved these talks. Thank um, you for all the work you're doing in Nevada too to protect Nevada wilderness. Thank you for your yeah. support for a really important cause. Congratulations on all the great work you're doing. It's been just a joy to be part of your effort here and give talks and connect with everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.